Hey everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, today I'm here with a very special guest and a friend of mine, Tara Lakey. Uh, Tara is a is actually referred to in our industry as the queen of wills. Um, and she's my go-to girl for most things when it comes to, or go-to lady when it goes to estate planning. But she's also an award-winning lawyer. Um, and this is a little bit about Tara. Uh, Tara is an estate planning specialist. She continues to work with advisors around the country to help educate their clients on the importance of estate planning or as I call it, keeping it in the family. Tara, Tara is not your typical lawyer in a lot of ways. She only does estate planning. She, she not only does estate planning, she does tax, asset protection, business succession, trust, and super. No disputes, no property stuff, okay? Uh, when Tara is not working with advisors on the power of estate planning, she's chasing around her little toddler at the beach, which I've been um, very... Uh, from afar he's so cute he's just grown so much it's amazing thank you so much for having me john uh no lovely to have you and obviously tara you know we've known each other for a few years and we've worked on a little bit of projects together and you know you know from a, from my perspective estate planning how important that sits to me and and for people that are listening or watching um you know, people sometimes think about estate planning as these kind of documents that sit at the bottom of your cupboard and you never kind of use them and Listen, there is a lot of legal paperwork that comes with estate planning, but me and Tara both believe that it's a much more bigger thing than that. And, um, you know, we did a session on this, oh, maybe even 12, maybe even 24 months ago. I can't even remember about this. But, you know, the biggest thing that we look at estate planning, it's essentially making sure your story is documented. And, um, you know, Tara, I know you're a big advocate of this. Um, and we will go, guys, um, and actually I'll put this for a second. And what I want you guys to know is, we're doing this and we're going through a few areas of estate planning that are not typical to just your normal will and power of attorney. So if you're listening and watching, it's not that I want you to kind of go, oh, John's going to talk about this boring stuff. It's not really about that. We want to be showing you the power of this stuff and how, how important it is. And so, um, you know, this is why I've got Tara on today. So Tara, before we keep going, how'd you get into this? Okay. I don't think I've actually asked you about this before. How'd you get into where you are now? And why are you so passionate about it? Oh, thank you so much for asking, John. I love talking about myself and particularly my passion for estate planning. I think I found myself practicing in estate planning quite unexpectedly. I definitely didn't think when I was at uni doing my law and accounting degree that I was going to get into dealing with dead people all day. Yep. Um, but I found myself going sort of through the tax mm -hmm. path and ended up in an adjacent kind of practice area with estate planning. And I just developed a huge passion for it. So I started out being your more traditional estate planning tax kind of lawyer. Mm -hmm. But what I found as my, I got more experience under my belt and I had a particular mentor who was very passionate mm -hmm. about this as well. You know, 75% of Aussies don't have a will or an estate plan. Like mm -hmm. estate planning is so important Last time I checked, you know, the death rate is 100%. Everybody will die at some point. So if everybody is going to die, why don't people prepare for this? And why don't they have wills? And I think part of the answer to that question is that it's not easy to go and see a lawyer and get your will done. It's, it's very easy to put it off and not mm -hmm. prioritize it and not think about it. And mm -hmm. so for me, I'm looking for a way to make it more accessible for everyday Australians to get their estate planning sorted so that they can mm -hmm. have peace of mind, get a mm -hmm. plan in place. And as you say, make sure their story is documented and everything that we're all working so hard for endures beyond our lifetime to actually make a difference and see our goals and our purposes realized no matter what happens to us. So I got into what I do now um, really by looking at a different way to approach estate planning and that is to support people like you John in mm -hmm. helping your clients get estate planning sorted because you're already talking to your clients mm -hmm. about a lot of things that really are estate planning conversations mm -hmm. and so what I do now rather than being your sort of traditional estate planning lawyer who types up wills mm -hmm. is that I support financial advisors, accountants, and lawyers to help them set up estate planning in their business to help their clients. And you've and really so become an expert. 
Yeah, exactly. And, 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 you know, that's where, you know, a lot of my educational journey kind of came from, you know, Katara and exactly from where we, where we met each other, um, you know, was really about me taking a position to say, you know, my client's story needs to continue beyond them. Um, you know, I'm looking after them. I'm looking after their children. I'm looking after their potential grandchildren, great grandchildren. And if we're going to accumulate all this wealth, well, we wanted to transition to these kids and these grandkids as these people are telling me. And so I'm in a crucial role to be able to transition that. And so then it's kind of coupled with, okay, well, we also wanted to then transition in the most tax effective way. Yeah. We want the highest probability of it actually happening. You know, um, yeah. there's a lot of horror stories and, and, you know, you'd see them as much as I see them and the news that are in this. And, you know, the person wants the money to go to this particular person and it doesn't end up that way, let alone in the most tax effective manner where the government says, hey, oh, actually on the way through, I'll just grab some of that. Um, and it's some things that you can avoid, some things that you can protect. And especially for maybe the age group that I kind of work with is just the millennials. Um, they sometimes think about it as a bit of like an old person's thing. Okay. And yeah, don't get me wrong. Your parents should have it if you're a millennial and your grandparents should have it. And this is something that, you know, everyone should have, because as you alluded to before, you know, unfortunately everyone dies, but it's not just death. Let's be honest. Yeah. Let's talk about, you know, the millennials and the millennial group. For me, the first thing that kind of comes to mind is, you know, who makes decisions for you if you can't make them? You know, if you're, if you, if you're, I don't know, even overseas, who can make those decisions for you? You know, we've both got young kids and, you know, it, it scares the living daylights out of me that someone could make decisions for my child who I don't want them to if I can't make them for them. For them you know, so we really need to be looking at not just the death rate, which, yes, we hope everyone lives a long and happy life, but it's also the case if you can't make decisions for yourself due to mental incapacitation or whatever it may be, or you physically just can't be there. So um, for me, it is a very big element around those documents to enable my story, my intentions and what I want to happen to happen for my children. And I would imagine most millennials and for people that aren't watching, Tara's nodding, but so I'm guessing she's feeling the same thing. But, um, you know, really, I think it's one that probably goes not seen and not talked about enough. Estate planning, once again, it's just that, you know, that will document or just that stuff, but it is beyond that, you know, Tara, isn't it? Absolutely. And I hear this all the time, you know, I'll be dead, who cares? But yeah. really, probably the scariest thing is if something happens to you, like you're in an accident and you don't die yeah. because you're still alive. We need people who you trust yeah. to be in charge of making decisions around your um, health care and medical treatment, your lifestyle decisions, you know, particularly if it's an enduring event where mm. maybe you can't look mm. after yourself or we can't recover, you know, what's your quality of life going to be like? And then, yeah, who's managing the finances for you um, and for your family? And, you know, often these you know, people get in an accident or an event happens and then they make a full recovery, but there's been a transition period where someone else has been making decisions on their behalf and you want to, you know, recover and you don't want to go, who made these decisions? What were they thinking? You want to know that the right people did the best they could in the circumstances for you. So actually, you know, planning for that event and it's not hard getting these documents in place they're absolutely critical if you don't have them it's an absolute red tape nightmare for all your loved ones you know they're already dealing with a really catastrophic event not to mention having their hands tied and trying to go through various tribunals like that's the last thing they need so just getting these documents in place to make sure people you trust can be empowered to look after you and your finances if they need to it's super simple but so many people just don't prioritize it and then leave it to the back burner it's a pretty important process to go through if you think about it that, that you know your life could potentially be in the hands of someone that you don't want it to be in and also let alone your children as well and um you know that's the one that kind of scared me and my wife and obviously we've gone off and we've done that and, and you know our, our estate planning is pretty comprehensive um in regards to you know we've tried to We've tried to keep it loose as well to everyone. We don't want, like we haven't done it too tight. Um, this is probably you know a, a discussion for another day. But we have tried to address a lot of things, you know. And 
we don't like talking about it, but, you know, even in the calamity event that me and my wife were to go, you know, who takes care of the kids, you know, and who who actually cares for them, who has the money, um, and are they the same people, what kind of roles are played out there. So, you know, it is a quite comprehensive thing as well too, but very, very important. Um, it, we're not just talking about death in some cases. Yes, we are in like calamities and, and particular situations, but, you know, if you can't make decisions for yourself, who makes them for you and your kids? And I think for most people who have kids, um, you know, that's a pretty important thing for them. I think the other one as well too that we focus a lot on, Tara, and we've spoken about this before, is when we're going through the financial planning process with our clients, we usually lead with estate planning. Now, we may not talk about it this way, um, as in, you know, we're going to talk about estate planning, but really what we're trying to do is make sure that we're investing the money or we've got the money held in the right ownership structures from the get-go. Um, and when we talk about keeping it in the family, when I speak to most of my clients and I say, okay, we're accumulating millions of dollars in wealth for you, um, would you like, where would you like that to go? You know, um, the obvious answer is, you know, to my partner or to my kids or whatever's going to go. And so making sure that we've got the most appropriate ownership structures is very important. And, and Tara, it's probably one that we see a lot of mistakes or a lot of people getting done. And if they don't set it up at the start, right, you know, there's a lot of consequences later on, um, in regards to the tax yeah. consequences and stuff like that. What do you think in regards to that stuff as well, getting it right from the start? Oh, it's absolutely critical, you know, particularly when it comes to um, purchasing assets. So there's two there's two sort of scenarios. There's assets that you purchase while you're alive, mm -hmm. getting those in the right structures, and then also in your estate plan, there's getting your estate plan structured properly. So which one should we talk about first, John? While Let's talk with the living. Let's talk with yeah. the living because I think I think we're going a bit morbid on the discussion already for everyone. But no, we'll, we'll, start, <laughs> yeah. we'll start with the living. Let's start with the living. So, okay. So, you know, there are structures that the government in Australia lets us set up like companies and family trusts that give us significant advantages from a tax perspective and also from an asset protection perspective. And when I'm talking about asset protection, I'm talking, as you say, John, keeping it in your family with your bloodline rather than having your assets exposed to claims by creditors. So if something happens to go wrong, particularly if you're in an occupation where you could be sued, um, like financial advisors, <laughs> lawyers, um, yeah. engineers, doctors, uh, accountants, dentists. doctors, all of, you know, anyone like that where you could be sued for something going wrong, or if you're running a business or a director of a company, these are particularly mm -hmm. important for you to consider. And mm -hmm. you, when you're buying or acquiring assets, it's essential that you consider getting them into the right entity because you really only get one chance to buy them in the right structure or mm -hmm. else you're going to face a lot of um, extra costs to rearrange the deck chairs after the event. So one takeaway that I really want your listeners to get out of our conversation today is if you're starting to make, you know, significant acquisitions of assets and you do think that you could be in one of those sort of at-risk occupations or a director, talk to John and the team first before you sign any paperwork or any contracts because it's super simple to set these up in the way that firstly gives you a lot of tax flexibility and tax advantages legitimate um mm -hmm. above the board you know government endorsed tax mm -hmm. advantages over owning them in your own name and also make sure that if something goes wrong in you know an area of your professional business life that you've ring fenced and quarantined this asset away from anything happening in those claims so that creditors can't get their hands on this asset and it's actually protected for you and your family it's interesting you say this tara like the one of the biggest erosions of people's wealth is unnecessary tax yeah, yeah. and having the right ownership structure is just so powerful in being able to minimize it legitimately um, and it's something that's underutilized. And for people that don't know, I'm actually a tax financial advisor registered with the Tax Practitioners Board. And we have to continue our upkeep in regards to our learning, in regards to tax strategies. And I probably see that for the clients who come to me, um, you know, maybe from their DIY days and doing it themselves, there's always usually assets that are in right, wrong structures. And I scratch my head, I'm just like, if only we started a decade ago, or whatever it's going to be. And 
And I think the other thing that is underutilized as well is, is, is the keeping it in the family scenario. Like, you know, if we're building millions of dollars of assets, if there's any kind of slightest crack in the wall, yeah, um, that someone can enter into, I want to make sure that I'm trying to fix that as, as quickly as I can. And inevitably, I want to make sure that there's no cracks at all times. So, you know, you know me, Tara, and, and for my clients who have worked with me, I'm, I am, you know, very much an advocate of asset protection and keeping it inside the family. And, and these, these ownership structures give you that other layer. And the way that I talk about it is I say, well, you've got a couple of options, okay? But the main option is you have it in your own name, okay? If you have it in your own name, well, everything's up for grabs, yeah? If you're sued, yeah. if if, the, if you're getting divorced, whatever's going to be the scenario, whatever attack on your wealth, yeah, it's in your name. At least explore the other options. Yes, the other options, you know, the next best option might not be completely bulletproof, but if that creates an extra layer around you and your assets, at least explore it. So for the people, you know, that are listening, it's about exploring those options. And some of these options might not be suitable for you, but speaking to an advisor that understands it, talks about it, um, and works through it with you can pay you extremely high dividends in making sure that your money's kept in the family and you're also getting tax effective strategies to help your wealth grow from you and for the generations to come. Now, we'll talk about one of the ones that I do get a bit of questions about, Tara, when I'm having chats, and it's around divorce, okay? And where I get to this, and this will be a this will be a segue into the next bit as well too, is some people say, you know, hey, listen, I'm building up these assets, okay, and let's just for for example, let's just say we're accumulating it in a family trust to make it easy, okay? So we're accumulating these assets in a family trust, and we've got two kids, okay, and what we want to do is we ultimately want to build this money for them, okay. Um, but we're scared that if they come into a relationship and they get divorced, yeah, you know, what happens there? You know, we, we, we might love our son-in-law or our daughter-in-law, but we don't love them that much, you know? Um, let's speak around the the, the the family trust scenario and then obviously we'll speak about the, the, the next one coming up. Sure. So family trusts are a wonderful vehicle for quarantining assets away from divorce proceedings. Now, they work particularly when you're handing on assets into the next generation. So for instance, if I went and set up a family trust with my husband and we put our assets in there together and then we got divorced, well, the courts just look at it as like it's our assets. They don't recognise the family trust. But for my children, particularly where I've got, you know, a few children sharing a testamentary trust, when they ultimately, you know, benefit or inherit from that testamentary trust, Mm -hmm. those assets are protected against any claim that one of their spouses could make because they basically say, you know, the assets in the trust don't really belong to any one of those children. Mm -hmm. They have the benefit of those assets, but they mm -hmm. don't really own any of them because it's a shared asset. And that's mm -hmm. how trusts work, basically. It's really about separating control and the ownership with the right to benefit. And I was going to mention to you, so there's, there's the testamentary trust and the family trust, guys. And the family yeah. trust, all I want you to know is that a family trust is usually set up upon when you're living, okay? And a testamentary trust is set up upon death, okay? They're kind of, from a high-level perspective, the difference between the two, okay? There are some particular differences, which we'll speak about in a moment. But just so for people that understand what we're talking about, there's kind of two ones here. And what we're also talking about, these trusts have different roles that sit within them okay and for using that couple with that kids scenario okay if they never relinquish control to their kids okay the kids actually aren't entitled to the money okay they're actually they're not entitled to it so if they're going through a divorce and tara please correct me if i'm wrong um but if they're not entitled to that money okay from a divorce perspective it's not theirs no, absolutely. It can't be um, divided up and handed over to the spouse. You know, the worst that could happen mm -hmm. is that it's it's treated as like a resource, you know, mm -hmm. when they're looking at, well, what, ac what funds do each of the parties in the divorce have access to when they're looking at, you know, needs and mm -hmm. people's means to provide, you know, provide for future children or something like that. But if it's in a trust, 
that asset is very rarely going to be able to be pulled out of that trust and given to a spouse. So it just gives you so much peace of mind that that asset is going to stay in your family for the long mm-hmm. term. And then when you go to the next level, which or not next level, let's when we to our next stage, unfortunately, yeah, where you've now passed away and now a testamentary trust gets set up. And, and for everyone that's listening, like I said, a testamentary trust is something that gets set up upon death. So think about it like you've got your will, okay? And inside your will, rather than the money being or the assets being transferred to the individuals directly, it gets set up upon death. So literally it's, hey, listen, rather than my money going to Mary, um, it's going to go in the form of a testamentary trust. And then inside that document will then illustrate the roles that are going to be inside that testamentary trust. Um, so let's speak around testamentary trust. And Tara, I know you're a big advocate of them. I am as well too. I see how powerful they are, especially from a tax minimization strategy um, for our clients as well um, and the protective elements. But maybe just you know some really good pointers and maybe where people get it wrong because the other bit that I want you to just touch on is I find a lot of people sometimes going to lawyers and they'll come out with a will and a power of attorney but then a testamentary trust wasn't in there or it wasn't deemed appropriate. Yeah. Thanks, John. I, I'm so happy that I am able to speak about this topic because it's one of my favourites. So, yeah, in terms of your takeaways for the listeners, the first was before you buy anything major, talk to John and the team <laughs> about how to structure it. The second one is when you're doing your estate plan, I really want you to have testamentary trust on your radar and make sure that whoever is guiding you and preparing the documents has addressed this with you and really talked you through about whether or not it's appropriate for you. I don't want to say everyone needs a testamentary trust, but you know, particularly for couples with young kids, I just think they are so important. You know, like I'm such an advocate for them that Whenever I get invited to a baby shower or any of my friends get married, I give them an estate plan with a testamentary trust because I think, you know, our parents' generation are used to getting these types of structures in place. But for us, I think we assume, oh, we don't own anything. It's our stuff is simple. We don't need them. But they're actually really powerful for us. Or if you have or are expecting young children, they're enormously valuable. So don't get lulled into thinking that they are um, too complex. And if somebody mm. does tell you that and they just dismisses you, then maybe you need a second opinion. And I know if, you know, if you're working with John to get your estate mm. planning done, you're not going to have a problem. John is, you know, all over testamentary trust and I've got, I would have no concerns there. But you know, if it's like a lawyer who norm- who helped you with buying a house or mm-hmm. handles, you know, your business contracts or something like that, and maybe they're not an estate planning specialist, they they might dismiss the testamentary trust without really giving you a good reason why. So I just want you to have this on your radar. Yeah, and I think I think the importance of it needs to be confirmed and understood when you're going to see a lawyer. Yeah. Um, and so we refer to estate planning specialists. So guys, just so you know, um, we've got a couple of relationships that are very strong with us. And the reason why they're so strong is because they understand the story that we're trying to work with. And ultimately, we just want to be ha- our clients to have the peace of mind that if something happens, it goes to the kids in the most protective manner or in the most tax effective manner or into the grandkids or the people you wanted to go to in those manners. Um, and, and so just a few high level advantages of a testamentary trust. So okay, one I need to speak about because I love talking about it is, sorry to steal your thunder, Tara, tax to children, okay? Um, not be ta- getting taxed at 66 cents in the dollar on every dollar over $416. Um, massive, massive. Like for us, it's it's absolutely huge when you've got kids, grandkids that are involved in here, being able to distribute that and use that as a vehicle is very impressive. Um, there are a bit of T's and C's that come with that, guys. So we see we are staying high level, but that alone 
um, having that power for that to be the case where they're then taxed at marginal tax rates of adults. So really, guys, at the current in 2021, it's about 18, 20 grand kind of tax free to each person, you know, who's not earning an income. You know, if you've got, you know, I don't know, 10 grandkids that we can chip off 20 grand each, um, it's pretty effective to get some tax free income into the hands that you want them to. Oh, absolutely. And I think those tax savings, I know people sort of switch off and their eyes glaze over when we talk about tax. But when you think about it, if there is a young couple and, you know, one of them has passed away and we've lost an income earner or a breadwinner for the family, having the inheritance money, you know, super life insurance, earn money for that family, basically tax free, makes all the difference you know particularly like if we think about being able to use that tax-free money to pay for school fees and education and all the extracurricular activities uniforms everything the kids need you've just got a huge head start compared to everyone else you know when you're lining up for school pickup and you can see everyone else and you're thinking okay they've had to go to work earn that money pay tax on that money and then use that after tax money to pay for everything and you are paying for it with pre-tax money it, it just makes that inheritance go so much further i was just working out a calculation while you were talking there tara because i love my numbers like everyone knows a twenty thousand dollar allocation to a tax-free member yeah gonna save someone approximately twelve thousand nine hundred and twenty five dollars uh and 44 cents if you want to be exact yeah so let's call it nearly 13 grand in a distribution um that's one year one person so if you kind of yeah. think about that multiplied over um millions of dollars of assets very very tax effective and very good now let's talk about the other element of it and i'll let you go with this one in regards to the protective side of stuff and we have spoken about this a little bit but you know, we're now talking about these assets being passed to the kids or the grandkids or whoever it may be. Um, yeah, what's the special powers or the superpowers of these testamentary trusts? They really are the best for protection. And I think to explain this, I'd like to use an example. So for myself, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I have um, a little almost two-year-old and my husband. And so in my will, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. we have a testamentary trust. And if my husband and I pass away, rather than just leaving everything to my son, which he would get when he turned 18, which is what most people mm -hmm. think of when they make mm -hmm. a will, right? I leave everything to my spouse and then mm -hmm. to our kids. And when our kids reach 18 mm -hmm. or maybe 21, they get their inheritance. We haven't done that. We've left everything mm -hmm. to a testamentary trust. Um, mm -hmm. So firstly, if I die and my hubby survives, the money is in that trust for him to manage for himself and our son together. Mm -hmm. And if he goes in a new relationship, and anyone, if you've seen my reel about what I think <laughs> I could look like on Instagram, yeah, I'm it. worried about this. So, you know, if he, well, I don't have to worry about what his new yeah. re next relationship looks like because I know that the money that I have left them, and like, let's face it, most of that money will be life insurance because we're still, mm -hmm. you know, on our wealth building journey but i had a heap of life insurance so most of that life insurance goes into the trust the new spouses future spouses can't touch it, it no matter what happens in that relationship if they get together break up divorce whatever it's quarantine for our son together so that gives me a lot of peace of mind um also he's in business doesn't matter what happens with his business that money is there for my son um if we both passed away, I know that I've put people that I trust in charge of managing that testamentary trust for my son, and they get to decide at what age he gets to be in charge of the money. So he will always receive the benefit of that money. So that money will be available to pay for expenses to him. And when he's over 18, you know, they can actually give him um, income, whatever they think is reasonable, but the big decisions about buying assets with that money, the investment structure, you know, keeping the trust going or closing it down, he doesn't get those decisions when he turns 21. Mm -hmm. People that I've put in charge of running the mm -hmm. trust get to decide when he's mature enough. 
and that is probably going to be closer towards 25 or 30. Mm -hmm. And I've sort of said somewhere between 25 and 30, I trust you to make a call, but mm -hmm. I don't want him to, you know, get a $2 million inheritance when he turns 21 because I've mm -hmm. seen so many kids blow it. And, and that's, you know, losing your parents at a young mm -hmm. age is one of the most devastating things I, that I think mm -hmm. can happen. And so the, the least we can do is set him up for life so that he's got money there to buy his house, to see the world, to, you know, start a business or whatever he wants. And I don't want him to get that money too young and blow it. I want to make sure it's ready for him. So protecting that money with the testamentary trust, if you don't have a testamentary trust, it doesn't work like that. You can't protect it. The testamentary trust is the only way. And this is what I was going to say. Everything you were just saying there, Tara, as a parent myself, is pretty much bang on what I want to happen. And you've and got one too, don't you, John? Yeah. yeah I'll go, well, we've got two little monkeys and uh, <laughs> then it's, mate, I'm more concerned about the people who've got to take care of them physically rather than anything self or something happens. <laughs> uh, but the, reali the reality is of it is that exactly what Tara said is, you know, very similar to what me and my wife want, yeah? And I would imagine, and I have these conversations a lot with my clients, it's a very similar conversation that everyone else wants. And all we're trying to do is say, address it, yeah? Well, well, you can, well, you're fit and healthy. Once you, you know, you're in the, we're in the right frame of mind, try and get this done, get it done as soon as we can, okay? And yes, it is going to need updating, guys. Like, don't think that it's not, you know? Every couple of years, we want to be pulling it out again, making sure, you know, people in the roles are the right people that we want in the roles. You know, Tara might love those people that she's put in there and trust them now. And then, you know, I don't know, had a barbecue and one called, one called her a bad name and now doesn't like her and wants to update it. Whatever's going to be the case, yeah, we just need to be making sure that these, have got, these things are maintained and they're the story that you want to happen if you can't say it yourself, okay? So, Tara... Thank you for sharing a lot with us and also personally as well too. And um, for people who don't know Tara, um, she's on on, on, linked, uh, on uh, LinkedIn, on Instagram as well. You can jump on Instagram and check her out. Um, she is a great resource for me and my team and a lot of advisors in the industry. And I'm glad to call her my friend. Um, Tara, thank you very much for sharing your insights on that. And for all the listeners, I hope you got a lot out of it today. Thanks so much, John. It's a pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.